Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Anna Myers, and I'm a former deputy director of the public, uh, former deputy director of public concern at work in the UK, uh, and I'm now uh, coordinating uh, WIN, optimistically named, because it's called the Whistleblowing International Network, to try and support uh, whistleblowing around the world, particularly support the NGOs, the whistleblower protection community that has been advising and counseling whistleblowers around the world for many years. Um, we organized this side event. We are having a little trouble connecting with Edward Snowden, unfortunately. Um, we have another speaker from the, within the U.S. who is connected, Morton Halperin. Um, and I would like to first, uh, we're here because of the important report that was just adopted by the uh, Parliamentary Assembly and written by Peter Omsik as Rapporteur and the Secretariat with the Committee of uh, Human Rights and Legal Affairs. One of the key issues for us who have worked in this field is, and the work that the Council of Europe has done in particular, is about putting the issue of whistleblowing and whistleblowing protection properly within a human rights framework. It is the right to information that all of us should have, and whistleblowers being very much our backup, our safety net. It's supposed to be an additional protection for us. Um, I will talk to you a little later about some of the trends that are happening now that are also working against some of the trends that we are very supportive of in terms of protecting whistleblowers properly. But I would say a couple of things. One is that the national jurisdictions are only just starting to get their act together. They're, the protections of, uh, for whistleblowers are improving in Europe, uh, but very slowly. And while we were doing that over the last 15 years, whistleblowers went global. And the reason whistleblowers went global, and it's the two ways in which they've gone global. One is by the information that they are revealing because it has global impact. They may work in a different place than the concerns and the issues they're raising will have their damage or their impact if they're not prevented. They're also working in multinationals and they're working in international organizations. Uh, and while, so this is happening because this is partly where power is going, but I would say if you thought about it as a, as a lawyer or within an accountability framework, it's also showing us where our accountability frameworks have not caught up. They're either broken or they in fact don't exist yet. Um, so we're in this interesting and very busy and very loud and very noisy uh, period. But the Council of Europe has done a number of reports and has started to build a corpus. And I would like first to give the floor to Peter Omsik, who has just um, been in the Parliamentary Assembly def talking about his report and defending it, and uh, I'd like to, we'd like to hear from him. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, Anne, for your introduction. Um, thanks for everyone supporting this, uh, this report. It's been a long journey with uh, quite a few hearings um, in this room as well. It's the third one with Edward Snowden. Um, the debates went well and the voting went exceptionally well because we were afraid that um, the Assembly would have called for Snowden to surrender and now they just say Snowden should be protected from the 1917 law which doesn't give him the right to use the public interest defense. Very happy about that but I just get the message that Mr. Snowden is online. We also have Morton Harper in online from the US and we have you. So we have three people that can give first-hand evidence. So I think we should use our time to, uh, to do that. All right. Um, again, more, uh, we understand that Edward Snowden was connected and is not connected. So I think um, we'll just, I'll stay calm. You will all stay calm. Um, and part of this is very much to talk about this report and where we're going. Um, and a couple of things that I wanted to point out, uh, and then I will pass the parole to Martin Halperin in the US if Edward Snowden is not yet connected. But one of the things that occurs to me from a British uh, perspective, and I have a Canadian accent, but this is where I've done the work on, on public interest whistleblowing. One of the first modern bills of rights was drafted in 1939 by H.G. Wells, J.B. Priestley, and Viscount Sankey. And their bill, which was a model for the European Human Rights Convention, banned secret dossiers. And that was done in 1939. Um, I think we can't wait for wars. Uh, and we can't wait for uh, economic collapse, and we can't wait for environmental destruction to start to refresh our challenges to secrecy in power, whether it's in the public or private sectors. Um, so I would like to, first of all, uh, 
ask if Morten Halperin is ready um, and whether he would like to respond to the report and the recommendations. Uh, in particular, I think uh, the Public of Interest Defense, which um, has some residents at the moment in the U.S. Thank you very much. Morten, are you there? Is there anybody who can tell me if Morton is uh, is linked, and if he could speak? Nope. Okay. I don't have earphones to know. Is I'm very sorry. This is where technology, even though it's part of what we've been discussing uh, in terms of the reports, so it does. Morton Halperin is. Okay. Morton Halperin, can you hear me? I can. Morton, are you there? I don't think he is, can hear me, or he's not. We can't hear him, one or the other. I can see a little signal. Uh, okay. All right. So I'd also like to introduce to you someone else who is going to speak after we heard from these other two speakers. His name is Martin Woods. And if anyone of you uh, came to yesterday's side event, we had three people who were long-standing professionals in their careers, one with the French Civil Service, one is a food safety scientist, and one Martin Woods, who was a, for 18 years a police investigator, policeman, and then a detective with the money laundering unit for the National Crime Squad in the UK. He joined compliance in a private bank and found himself on the sharp end of whistleblowing, at least in terms of the, the retaliation and the response he had. He talked about his case a lot yesterday. Perhaps he could refresh us a little bit, but also to talk about what he thinks the issues are in compliance, in banking, and some of the issues that are facing whistleblowers now in that sector. Thank you, Martin. Um, well, thank you, Anna, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Peter, for this invitation. It's uh, a great honor and pleasure to be here before the council. And, and I'll give you some generics before we go into the story. Um, and Anna, at any time you a word um, Edward's on, just stop me. <clears throat> So I'll try and fill, fill the gap. Technology will always let you down, technology and, chil technology and children. It was only a year ago, in the last 12 months, that the German language actually identified a, a word for whistleblower in its own right, because the natural translation prior to that was actually traitor. And of course, a as whistleblowers, many of, us see, many of us are seen that way. Now, I know my fellow countrymen um, lobbied this morning to change some of the um, clauses, and um, from the jaws of defeat, Peter grabbed the victory. Well done, Peter. Uh, the UK doesn't like whistleblowers. The UK politicians don't like the whistleblower that blew the whistle on their expenses. That was the biggest crime, not actually claiming for mortgages that didn't exist on houses that didn't exist, etc. Um, the, there are grounds to believe that the UK, the state, the UK state, were engaged in the killing of Dr. David Kelly, who blew the whistle on the lies about weapons of mass destruction. And the UK's economic interest is squarely aligned with their national interest, and therefore within financial services, the UK don't like whistleblowers in financial services, which is, as I said yesterday, is why a trader can write an email that says, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. He's comfortable to write that email because there's no credible deterrent or fear or anxiety that one amongst him would blow the whistle. I'm not unique as a financial services whistleblower, there are many others in Europe, in the UK, in the US. Um, but what I would say about Edward Snowden and, and, and the importance of Edward Snowden is he's shown, that, shown us that our governments cheat. They break laws, they abuse power, they operate in a way that is not accountable. And I do not want my children or my grandchildren to grow up in such a regime which is why 800 million people in Europe are grateful to Edward Snowden for what he did. Moreover, if the institutions of this continent cannot provide a safe haven for the most important whistleblower of our time, 
there is a, a real danger that the credibility of what we're seeking to achieve will be severely damaged. If we can't protect Edward Snowden, can we really truly protect other whistleblowers? Now, I think you're ready online. Hi. Thank you, Martin. Um, we have Martin Halperin online. Can you hear me, Martin? Yes, I can. Great. Um, just to let you know that um, Edward Snowden sort of was, uh, was connected and then wasn't connected, so we'll, we'll wait to see if we regain that connection. Um, the report was debated this morning, um, and perhaps if you would just want to, to uh, confirm, there was very few changes. There's no changes to the report, uh, and there was very few changes to the resolution. And we'd really like your, uh, your take and your experience and your views on, on various aspects of the report on improving the protection of whistleblowers. Sure. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I think the situation is, is, is very clear that we need whistleblowers and we need to find ways to protect whistleblowers and pr provide procedures which enable them uh, to proceed in a way that both protects what should be protected and which uh, allows the public to gain the information that it needs. The simple fact is that uh, most governments, in fact, maybe all governments, keep information secret, that they decide what should be kept secret on the basis, even when they're doing their job as they're supposed to do it in the war, simply on whether there would be any harm from disclosure of information. Very few countries uh, permit and almost none require people, government officials, to take account of whether or not uh, there is a strong public value of the information. And so you have a situation, as we had with some of the information that uh, Snowden has released, uh, that governments are engaging in massive surveillance, uh, which the American public, in this case, and the European publics, knew nothing about, and in which... Uh, Government officials did not feel any obligation to release that information because they had no obligation to take uh, account of the public knowledge of the information. Do you need to? Sorry, Morton. Um, there was just wondering if your mic was in front, uh, whether it was in back. Yeah. Because we're it's just here. Having... Is this better? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just and interrupt? Because we had um, a, a few moments where uh, we weren't connecting, and I failed to properly introduce you. So very quickly. Morton Halperin has a, uh, has a long career as a senior advisor to the White House, uh, and he's now um, a senior advisor to George Soros Foundation. He can give you a little more details if you want to expand on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, government officials do not take account of the public's right to know, and that needs to change. And I think that means that every democratic country needs to have a, a classification law which requires government officials balance the public value of the information uh, with uh, the harms of national security. And we need some absolute rules. For example, surveillance should not be conducted except according to clearly known public rules about what the government's claimed authority is and what the government actually does. So in some cases, it's not sufficient to balance the public's right to know. The public's right to know has to take clear preference, and that's in cases that describe what the rules are for surveillance, it's for situations where the government is engaging in illegal activities like torture uh, or uh, other violent, massive violations of human rights. And the war also needs to provide protection for whistleblowers, as it does not in most countries and does very inadequately in the United States. For example, our war does not cover contractors and therefore does not provide Edward Snowden with a way to which he could uh, reveal. So at the front end, you need to require government officials to take account of the public's right to know. That has to be embodied in the right to information laws, so that if, if somebody makes a request, the court or a neutral body can determine not only if there is harm, uh, but also balance that harm against the public's right to know. And finally, whistleblowers need protection. They need a place to go to release the information. And if that system fails them, they need to have the right to a defense, a whistleblower defense, saying that they released the information for the purpose of educating the public about some serious violation of human rights, and that, in fact, uh, it would 
both their intent and objectively it did do that. That's missing from the U.S. law uh, and I think is a serious impediment to whistleblowers and something that now should be clear needs to be changed. Why don't I stop there because I'm happy to respond to questions. Sorry, thank you very much, Morton. Um, one of the things that I thought uh, would be very interesting for you to reflect on is this idea that is in the Schwane principles, uh, which are the global principles on right to, inf um, right to information and national security. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that many of us who work in whistleblowing are really, really um, very cognizant of. We're not sort of blow we're not protecting whistleblowers because they're a, they're a seen group that we can we can spot among us. They're not people that are particularly um, uh, they're not people who actually intend to be whistleblowers. The vast majority of them. Um, and one of the things that we find is when people blow the whistle, we find out the issues that we need to know and we start to address those issues. And that's really where Edward Snowden, we owe him a debt of gratitude because he's talking about uh, the overreach of, of national security um, and also that the information is then kept from us. And it has prompted the right debate, in my view, of trying to say where does the line, where should the line be drawn. But it also talks about a public interest defense, so that even if you are breaking the law by releasing secret information or, um, or confidential information, uh, certainly in the criminal situation, that you have an ability to have a public interest defense. And it would be very interesting to hear an American point of view, because we don't hear it very much on this side, uh, in this debate, um, of what that means. Yes, I should have, of course, mentioned the Joanne principles. Everything that I'm saying is is in those principles. Those principles, I think, uh, are a compilation of best practices and uh, best procedures and provide an explanation of where these principles come from and what the defense of them uh, is. Uh, I think, in my view, it's not enough to provide this as a defense. I think we need to build the, the balancing test, the need to take account of the public value of information into the original decisions which allow government officials to classify information and keep it from the press. They should always be required to ask the question, not only is there a reasonable expectation of harm, but what is the importance of this information to public debate? And because government officials will always tend to err on the wrong side of that, uh, we need some absolute principles. Uh, in the American system, the principles are that you can't classify for the purpose of covering up illegal activity. But that just misses the point. Government officials don't classify for that purpose. They classify to protect the information in their view. The rule has to be that you can't classify information which describes illegal activity. Um, and you can't classify information which describes violations of human, fundamental human rights. And in my view, you should not be able to classify information which explains how government officials interpret legislation which authorizes them to engage in surveillance of private persons in the, in the country, but also in other countries as well. So we need these absolute rules. In the absence of them, uh, but even in the presence of them, we need also to build into the criminal procedures, if there are any, um, an absolute defense. My view is that there should not be criminal penalties for the disclosure of information by government officials, except in very narrow categories, carefully prescribed in law and with a built-in public interest defense. And in the absence of that, in my view, it violates freedom of information. It violates what we call the First Amendment in the United States, freedom of speech, uh, to penalize um, government officials' efforts to inform the press and the public about what their own government uh, is doing. In the United States, we got along without anybody being criminally charged through the whole Cold War. I think governments can and should protect their information without resorting to the criminal process. Thank you very much, Mort. Um, there's a possibility, again, that we'll be connected to Mr. Snowden, but it's still um, um, on, happening. I'd like to point out a couple of things, because yesterday when we had the three whistleblowers who were talking about their cases, one of the things that I wanted to, and we wanted to do with this side event was to say what the way forward is. What do we have to um, talk about within our national jurisdictions? 
And one of them is the public interest defense, so that you don't, you are able to, in a criminal court, explain uh, that why you took the actions you took. Um, but the other thing that is happening, and I think it's one of the things that I'd like to, to raise here, and it'd be interesting if there are any questions from the floor, is this issue of what's happening with corporate, corporate power. Um, and it's also a similar discussion in a way. Um, for us, it seems very obvious, and maybe it doesn't seem so obvious to other people. But um, the trade secret uh, EU directive that has recently been going through the European Parliament took what we in the, in the world of right to information thought was a very uh, narrow definition of what a trade secret was. And they've expanded that. And by expanding that, they almost make it, they do say that it's not just covering trade secrets, but it's covering bit confidential business information. By doing that automatically, they're starting to push out whistleblowers, or people will become whistleblowers because the nature of information becomes much more difficult to access. Uh, and it also is something that uh, um, affects journalism because it starts to what we would say is even if it's civil law but also criminal law, it starts to make it normal to go after people who release information rather than looking at the information and deciding whether or not it's, it's in the public interest. And I think one of the things for us isn't just about protecting whistleblowers, as I said earlier, it's, it's not that you create the system where everything's secret and we are all protected because there's a few whistleblowers who are protected by law. We want it the other way around. We want to have access to that information. And as part of our ability to challenge where the, the, the lines are drawn between what is genuinely secret and what we agree we think that even private corporations can hold on to for, for, for certain reasons, um, that we're not actually starting to let that go. And we have now whistleblowers as our first line of defense, our only line of defense, and in a, in a situation where they're actually less protected rather than more protected. Is there a comment that um, you would like to make uh, on the panel to that issue or whether there was any questions or comments from the audience? The, the danger with um, such a notion is that more so than is presently the case, the whistleblower becomes a target as against the information being the issue and the conduct of the corporate entity becoming the issue. We are giving the corporate entities a piece of legislation, a tool through which they can prevent the whistleblower ever disclosing the information in the first instance. And in the event the whistleblower does disclose the information, we can attack the whistleblower for breaching this piece of law. We are almost creating a charter that facilitates and almost encourages corporate entities to break the law with the comfort of knowledge that if anybody were to disclose this confidential information about their criminal conduct, that of itself would be the crime and they could close the information down. Again, it's this lobbying power of the corporate entity within some of the European institutions, particularly the European Union, to bring about a piece of legislation that prevents the public being informed of their criminal conduct. Um, it's a very, very dangerous way ahead for us as citizens of Europe. Well, you have to make that practical. And um, I often find when I talk to politicians and colleagues that they are very wary of whistleblowers. And you saw it in a debate today. The ones that spoke out were quite fairly vocal. When you looked at the voting behavior, they were still talking about whistleblowers having to surrender. Which, doesn't, which means that people don't understand the, um, the health and safety issues at stake. So when I look at how we communicate, we should communicate in the examples of the mis-selling, in the examples of the FIFA World Cup. There were whistleblowers, many of them inside the FIFA. And now everyone seems to have known for 10 years that the FIFA was corrupt. Now, if you can't do it in an organization which doesn't have anything fundamental or fundamental rights at stake. It's a game, it's a very nice game, but nothing more than that as far as I'm aware of. Then where can you do it? So make sure you make the examples also before the public court. Because it's very difficult to do something about the directive, I can tell you. This directive is directly implemented and it doesn't even pass by national uh, parliaments. I mean we just have to uh, we just have to obey with it. Um, um, 
but um, he had to turn that back. Um, so far, there has been almost too much attention for whistleblowing in Secret Services, because it was new that in 2009 we said that there should also be something in there. But the main thing still happens in bureaucracies and normal firms, and then more in multinational firms than in your uh, corner shop, shall we say. So that's why we don't need this kind of law. Martin, would you do you have any comment on that? And then I'll open to questions. No, I'm, I'm happy to okay. take questions if there are. Yes, I have the question concerning um, this public interest um, definition. Is it right that before a court in the United States, you only have the possibility to explain why you did what you did if you can, uh, if you have the possibility of this um, public interest um, motion? Thank you. Well, there is no public interest defense in the United States, so you have no defense at all. The government simply shows <clears throat> that you had either authorized or unauthorized access to information relating to the national defense, which is defined as information which is properly classified. And then you gave it to somebody who, quote, did not have authority to receive it, which means either somebody without a security clearance or even somebody with a security clearance but without the right to know. And that's all the government has to show. It does not have to show a magnitude of harm, and it does not have to deal at all with the question of what was the importance of the information to public debate. So it doesn't matter if what you revealed showed that the United States government was torturing people or that it was conducting surveillance in violation of what everybody understood the law to be. Uh, you, you have no right to raise even that because it has nothing to do with whether you're guilty or not because the criminal statute doesn't cover it. Now, conceivably in the penalty phase when the judge is deciding how long a jail sentence to give, he might allow testimony on that question. But on the core question of whether you're guilty or not, it is simply absolutely irrelevant whether your motive was to make money because you sold it or to inform the public about some gross violation of human rights and whether objectively it informed the public about something valuable. I mean, we see in the case of the Snowden revelation about uh, the, the compacting of the records on the metadata records that it led to an end of that program in the United States. That would be irrelevant in the criminal in the criminal trial, even though it clearly shows that the information was very important to public debate, and when release led to a positive outcome. Uh, of the situation. So we need to change the law so that, in the first instance, the government can't classify without balancing, and in the second, that if there is a criminal prosecution, the criminal defendant can bring forward this as a defense uh, to the prosecution. But um, if I understand this right, if you need law first, before Snowden can come back to the States without fear, then he'll maybe he'll wait for like 50 years or so? Well, I think, I mean, the government, as a matter of discretion, could obviously engage in, in plea bargaining with him and agree to some no jail term or some limited term. Or uh, I do not see how it could agree to allow him to promote a a public interest defense. Even if Congress were to pass one, it would not apply retroactively to the crime that he committed. So th that would all, if it was ever done, and I see no in indication that anyone in the U.S. government is interested in such a deal, it would have to be done uh, as a negotiation between Snowden's lawyers and the U.S. government. I don't see how it could be done by legislation. I think and I see no prospect of such legislation. Um I was just wondering, do you want to respond to anything? No. Um, I think also, sorry, there is a, one more question. Yeah, uh, may I ask you, um, I'm a journalist, I actually uh, work for the Voice of America. What should American government do to make Snowden agree to come back? Okay. Thank um, you. Can I just say, this is, I mean, it's, Okay. Lord Halpern is not representing um, Edward right. Snowden. I'm going to pass on that question. Thank yeah, you. and um, we're here to sort of more discuss this report, which does have obviously an impact on the. Edward but this Stone is case. actually relates to what government should do to make this uh, this 
whistleblower blower feel safe? This is basic question. This basic is not, question, not uh, particular to that case. Yeah. 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 But 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 my Highlight question it. about exact situation with the U.S. government. Well, I all, what I can answer very briefly is that the law that he's being charged under, there isn't, a, as, as Mort was saying earlier, there isn't a public interest defense. There's no possibility under the Espionage Act. I think what we're trying to say is that's a real lesson in Europe as well, that we can't get into a situation where those kind of laws are being used. It's a law that was, used, was, for, was meant for a different purpose. It's a 1917 law. Uh, we don't want uh, in Europe for that to be something that's seen as the, as the benchmark at all. And I think one of the things in this situation is this has been building for some time. There were a number of whistleblowers prior to Edward Snowden who were also being charged and convicted under the Espionage Act recently. Uh, the thing is that in resolution which has been adopted today, Council of Europe, which I respect very much, asked U.S. government to uh, allow Snowden to come back without any uh, fear of persecution. What's the way the Council of Europe see to do this? It's very difficult. I mean, we don't have any formal weight. The United States are an observer state, have an observer status in the Council of Europe. Um, this is not a formally binding statement. It's a statement by parliamentarians out of 47 countries. Um, and actually, we, are, we said it slightly differently. The United States of America, the Assembly therefore calls on the U.S. Uh, to allow Mr. Snowden to return without fear of criminal prosecution on the conditions that would not allow him to raise the public interest defense, which means that we do not say to the U.S. you cannot prosecute him because it would be strange for one democratic country to say to another democratic country, you're not allowed to prosecute that, that, and that guy. Well, what we do say is don't use the 1917 Act. Don't use any act in which he can't say there was a public interest in it. As Mr. Harperin just said, you, um, the whole thing is the United States implicitly already has admitted fault. And I really like that bit of the United States. The United States is quite a bit ahead of a number of European countries that are still denying there is a problem. Now, the, the, the U.S. hasn't solved everything in its legislation. But at least they have a vivid debate on that, which we don't have in Europe yet. Um, then there is the problem with retroactivity. But yes, that you solve with, um, um, with negotiations. That's why it's handy for Mr. Snowden not to be in the United States at the moment, because that gives him a position to talk to the authorities about uh, what would happen if he, uh, if he were to return. And that's as far as we can interfere. And you notice it in the debate that a lot of parliamentarians find it very difficult to talk about individual cases. And they are to some extent right, because we do think differently on this case. But if you start treating cases case by case in Parliament, then you're sort of breaking down the Trias Politica in, in, in one way or the other. So you have to have a bit of care. But because of what he's done, I thought an exception, and mentioning him in the report was quite in place. Are there any other questions? Um, what I'd like to do is, is actually just mention a few of the other cases that many of you might be aware and start to link them together because I think this is where we need to be really clear when we're talking about whistleblowing. We, we, on one hand, we've, the report has, has directly addressed what was an absence or a gap in most legislation, but also in the recommendation that was adopted by the Council of Ministers, the 2014 uh, recommendation. It often is the carve-out when you get whistleblowing protection laws that you don't touch that area, and that needs to start to change. And, and I think that's where uh, what Edward Snowden did changed the debate uh, significantly around whistleblower protection in Europe in particular. But if you think about Antoine Del Tour, who did not, ra did not disclose necessarily anything that was illegal, but ca has caused a huge um, reaction in Europe, and he is now facing five years in jail and 1.2.5 million euro fine. Uh, and he's the one sort of taking the fall for something that perhaps we should have asked more about or had access to that information earlier. Um, and other, other whistleblowers such as, um, sorry, I've just had my little list, but such as under Edward Snowden, mass surveillance, we have Antoine Del Tour, and we have some recent cases at the UN level where um, uh, uh, a long-standing official 
who uh, passed a report to the French uh, military who actually did start to investigate uh, potential uh, allegations of child sex abuse by French troops in the Central African Republic. Uh, is now, it was suspended for, for leaking a confidential report. So you start to wonder where the lines are and what we're, we're actually dealing with. I apologize, would you like to take the floor or would there like to be questions and I will get back. Yes, please, questions. Um, a, we're trying to solve the, <laughs> the connection problem to Moscow. Any other questions? Can I have another one? Uh, in terms of Council of Europe, you are in a paradoxical situation when we now speak about whistleblowers in any way, uh, democratic countries where public wants governments to be accountable. Yeah. But there are other members of Council of Europe where whistleblowing is basically almost impossible. And you know what I'm talking about because I represent Russian service of the Voice of America. You represent, sorry? Russian service of the Voice of America. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of this, what, uh, how Council of Europe could tackle uh, this problem when uh, whistleblowing in some countries like Russia and Azerbaijan, uh, some others in the Council of Europe area, is almost impossible? What, what should be done in that? Well, it's difficult enough as it is in some free, freer countries than Russia or Azerbaijan. Um, that's why we asked the Committee of Ministers to come up with a framework convention. That's a much used legal instrument here in the Council of Europe. Um, a framework to protect whistleblowers and to put sort of minimum standards. But you shouldn't be that negative. It's, it's especially the countries that come out of a situation of serious problems that change their laws. Serbia is at the forefront, and Serbia wasn't a model democracy 10 years ago, I can tell you. Quite the contrary. So seize the opportunity when it, when it happens, I would say, to make sure you get good legislation. And then you always have the chance, like you have with the Trade Secret Directive, that you have some black backsliding, so you have to uh, keep awake. And, and I'm aware, you notice that I've organized multiple side events with people from Azerbaijan and most of the people I invited here were then picked up and put in prison um, that it's extremely difficult in those countries but it shouldn't prevent us from trying if I can respond because one of the things that we found at public concern at work in the UK um, for you know we set up 15 years ago we were part of the uh, organization that helped draft the public interest disclosure act which is now on the books and we advise whistleblowers we were always being contacted by civil society around the world. One of the first workshops I ran um, whistleblowing was in Nigeria, not in the UK. Um, and we have been contacted by uh, organizations, civil society, that really want to understand how it can work in their countries. And it is happening because there are young people setting up both journalist websites, so media websites, but they're also, like in Serbia, seeing this as part of their democratic right to, and to protect whistleblowers opens up that, that ability for catalysts for change. But to have laws that work when you don't necessarily trust your judiciary, you don't necessarily have an independent police force, you don't often have an, an independent media, which is where there are these young people and young, um, people are stepping outside of the, of the media to do new independent media because they can do it without conflict. Um, and it's incredibly brave from my point of view, but they want to do it. And their societies have whistleblowers. I think one of the things is we hear lots of bad stories, we hear that they need to be protected, but guess what? They keep coming. Um, and they keep coming even when there's bad stories. And some of them will come because it starts to have a momentum that starts to make it normal and starts to say we can question this issue. And I'm never sure where those lines come in, but it does happen. And in the Whistleblowing International Network, we're starting to talk and develop these issues because they've asked, not because we've gone around with some international principles and said you have to do something. They've come to us, and it can come from consumer protection because babies have died um, using contaminated milk, because they've got issues around environment, and because they've got corruption. It doesn't always come from a kind of whistleblower protection point of view. It comes from 
what's happened in their societies. And it's starting to change, but it's one of those very fragile mu movements, and it's one that we have to nurture. We also have to understand that in these countries there are different challenges. And we have Mr. Snowden. Hello, um, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello. Yes. I apologize for the trouble. Uh, it Hi, seems like Mr. we had some Snowden. technical difficulties. So, Edward Snowden, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. You're Hi. a little bit quiet, but I can I can uh, that. There was, it was not a technical end at uh, a technical hitch at Mr. Snowden's end. It was a complete uh, breakdown in communication. Um, on my part as well as others. So I apologize to you, first of all. Um, and what I wanted to do was, and what we wanted to do at this side event was both talk to the individuals that we've talked to already, but give you an opportunity to respond to the report. Obviously, you're not talking about your own case in the detail at all, um, and we expect those in the room to respect this. Um, but we wanted to ask you a few questions, and I had a few um, that I'd sent earlier, very general questions to allow you to talk about some of the issues, and one of them was to give you the opportunity really, first of all, to respond to the report, uh, which has been adopted with very minor changes to the recommendations, and it still includes the right to return in the resolution, um, uh, the right to the, for you, the requesting the right for you to return with the opportunity to have a public, def a public interest defense. So we give the floor to you for a few moments on that. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone at the council for the opportunity to speak. Uh, if I could just make one quick technical suggestion real quickly. Uh, it appears we have someone else on the Hangouts call. Uh, they have a live microphone that's feeding the static right now. If they could mute that, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in response to the report, I think it's incredibly strong. Uh, it's very helpful. It's a major step forward uh, when we're talking about the issue of whistleblower protection. Uh, within Europe, but also internationally. One of the primary concerns that I've had uh, over the last two years, looking at how things have gone forward, is that we've had uh, particular cases that have shown people have come forward, whether they're uh, discussing tax information, the activities of banks, uh, national security institutions, where they have shown concrete evidence of wrongdoing, uh, and yet national governments have tried to hold them personally accountable uh, for some sort of technical infraction or some other means uh, for which they haven't been able to mount any kind of meaningful or effective defense because there's these concepts of strict liability uh, within their national legal codes that say regardless of whether it was right or wrong, uh, regardless of whether or not this served the public interest, regardless of whether or not this information should have been known or concealed to begin with, uh, because this is a technical infraction, uh, you have shared information with a journalist, uh, with a government institution, uh, with even the police, uh, you should suffer some punishment as a result for this. And you cannot challenge that uh, distinction in court. You can't mount an effective public interest defense. And this is, I think, really the central axis of the report, which is the most valuable, is that it argues that whistleblowers should always have access to a public interest defense. Uh, I think that's central. I think that's vital. Uh, more uh, one step beyond that, what is the future? What uh, steps did the report uh, not take at this juncture, but I think will be necessary in the future, is really the fact that there is one suggestion in the report that says uh, roughly that if there are internal disclosure uh, mechanisms available within an institution, within an agency, uh, within an organization, uh, and the employee does not avail themselves of those mechanisms, uh, if they don't self-report, for example, to the leadership of the agency or to some, uh, some board inside a government organization before they share information with the press, this should be taken into consideration um, when they are determining uh, whether this person is or is not entitled to protection uh, from retaliation in this circumstance or that. I would argue that in the future, what we are likely to see uh, is that boards, uh, organizations, governments uh, will say, yes, you have a right to a public interest defense, but they will try to use uh, the fact that individuals did not disclose uh, information to a board, they did not self-report, uh, at the institutional or national level 
uh, to sort of undermine them, to take away their claims of protection uh, for retaliation, because what the report does not state, and I think this is really sort of a central clause that should be considered as an amendment in the future, is that uh, that should be considered. Uh, basically, an employee not reporting to an organization, to an internal mechanism, should be indeed uh, considered in regard to whether or not they acted in the most responsible way, in the, self, uh, in the public interest way. If the institution, or if the protections, uh, if sort of the um, mechanisms that are provided by these internal boards are equal or greater to the protections that are proposed generally by the Council of Europe and other organizations. Basically, what we need to do is we need to set an international standard of protection from retaliation, uh, which can be made uh, greater by national governments, by institutions, by organizations, but it cannot be weakened. Uh, if we allow a broad exception on the basis of, uh, for example, these internal mechanisms, uh, but we don't distinguish whether or not they provide an equal or greater measure of protection, we're basically providing uh, some level of clause as a society, uh, which allows them to try to undermine uh, protections that would otherwise be effective. Those would be my primary comments on the report. Thank you very much. I think you're picking up on slightly, uh, it's always interesting to have these discussions, a, diff a nuanced view or a different way of, I think, um, putting into context what we would, what I would argue is that there should be access to information and you shouldn't be punished and it's a narrow bit of information that is kept secret or confidential for very valid reasons. And certainly in the Public Interest Disclosure Act in the UK, and I think it was um, put, it, this is one of the points that the report picked up on, um, is that if you have good reason to believe that raising it internally won't work, that you've seen three people try it um, and not and not get uh, not just that they get are retaliated against, that the issue isn't dealt with. If there's any sense the organisation says you can't go properly to the to the authorities, then that is the trump card for you to be protected for wider disclosures anyway. All of this is about us wanting the information and looking at the information. It is not about a sort of um, that, that we want to just protect whistleblowers because, you know, because there's no reason for it. We don't, we do work in organizations where we want some capacity to do our business in the normal way and not have everything be on, in the uh, public domain immediately. But we're also living in a, in a world that's changing really rapidly and information is being shared very differently. And there's a whole generation of people younger than me that see information in a different way. So I think some of what you're saying would be very interesting if you had a comment at all, Peter, to his, uh, to Edward Snowden's suggestion. Well, I, 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 I like the suggestion. Yes, for me, the public interest defense was crucial to get in there. And you just probably missed the voting, but let me tell you, um, there was an amendment which would have pretty much destroyed it, which um, got rejected by quite a small margin. So it's still quite contentious, even after all the work you've been doing and all the work other whistleblowers like uh, like here have been doing so it will be one step at a time and that's why we wrote it down this way because this is as far as we can get it having said that in a normal circumstance you would expect that in a normal organization um, you would be able to raise something so I still think it should be the normality that you should try to raise it with your with your staff and it should be exceptional that you're uh, called to become a whistleblower because it uh, entails quite high cost um, on the follow-up, we're trying to set up this framework convention, but I do not have expectation that that will happen within a year or two and everyone will become a member. Before you uh, joined us, we already had people who were inquiring when Russia and Azerbaijan would uh, join um, in uh, whistleblower protection. And um, I don't think uh, all 47 countries of the uh, Council of Europe would readily uh, sign up uh, to, to a framework convention, but we should try to set a norm and then to enforce it. And then the other difficult issue which we have been dealing here with is that new European legislation which overrides the national legislation of 28 member states um, of this Council of Europe um, has been going the other direction at points, uh, especially when you talk about trade secrets. Uh, so that also needs to be dealt with in the, in the future. So ample space for another report, but not, not tomorrow as far as I can see. Perhaps I could just put on the table a few other aspects that are we are seeing in the in the whistleblowing world, and it is it, 
picks up on the point that, that Mr. Snowden just made about technical, for technical reasons. If you come out of the national security arena again and you look at banking, um, where there's been high levels of secrecy um, around the banking in different countries, then, and even where there's not, um, we've certainly come across many cases where people are being charged with theft, regular theft. So they would be covered by the Public Interest Disclosure Act, say, in the UK, but they're being charged with theft for taking a memory stick or taking paper out of the office. So we're always sort of aware that um, you have to be on your toes. You have one law that is meant to give some protection, but you have to be aware of where the other ways of stopping information and attacking the individual. And that's where, again, we would say it's really unfair of us as a society, of me and my family, to rely on whistleblowers to make our world safer and, and more protected and, and legally um, working properly because we need to demand that as societies. Whistleblowers are giving us the signal and not often taking the fall uh, for a debate that then we might get around to sometimes, but often they're giving us the information that we are actually, it is a gift to us and we should be treating that information very, very carefully. But that should also be an institutional design. And um, we've seen in banking that you have banking secrets and it's very difficult to disclose them and you saw the same thing in national security. What I'm very afraid of that in a, a number of new um, European projects, not much attention is, is paid to how we set up the new institutions. Like the banking union has got bleak spots. The European Court of Auditors is not allowed to actually control on the banking union in the ECB. So you don't have your first lines of defense ready. If I give you one ex example, the EFSF, which is where most of the money paid to Greece was paid from, which is being guaranteed by 27 other states. Um, it's a small company and it's based in Luxembourg. So um, it benefits from all the secrecy laws of Luxembourg for small companies. That combination of small company in Luxembourg means that even though, because it has only a small number of employees, um, it's a small company, even though it has paid out more than 200 billion euros. And um, uh, that means that we as taxpayers can't even control it. So I think we should start beforehand and think in our institutional design, okay, if we want to help Greece, we might well want to help Greece, but we should be able to, to control how the taxpayers' money is being spent. And um, that is for me the main uh, thing to look at, and that's also the thing which we had at Trade Secrets um, a few minutes ago by Mr. Woods. Edward, it's very nice to make your acquaintance, if not by video, Martin Woods uh, is my name. Um, what I would say to the report and what's very important, what was kind of missing at times, is the need for protection drives the possibility of whistleblowing being a credible deterrent, yep. where people are anxious that if I am going to do something wrong, there are those amongst my colleagues who may tell the authorities, because we in the Council of Europe today and other institutions are creating a mechanism within which the whistleblower can believe, our communities can believe, and people who would do something wrong could fear and could have anxiety that I will be found out because there is a mechanism that will allow for people to go and tell others, third parties, authorities, that I am doing wrong. So the prevention aspect is something we really need to take a hold of to benefit wider society, to discourage people because they have to be anxious that I will get caught. And without adequate whistleblower protection, that credible deterrent disappears. Spoken as a true policeman. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. I, I wondered, Edward, Mr. Snowden, and, and Mort Halpern, if there was any just final comments and whether we could have maybe one or two questions and, and, uh, and then we have to go because of the timing, I'm afraid. If I could make a, a comment uh, quickly as a follow-up to the deterrent point. I think that is important, and I think what we've seen largely as a result of sort of the last several years where whistleblowing has been a topic of public debate, there have been uh, significant examples in a number of different sectors, as was mentioned, the, the banking, the financial stability fund, uh, is that the quality of information that we have access to as a society is directly proportional, directly related uh, to the quality of decisions that we enjoy from our government, uh, and then the quality of government itself. Uh, the point about deterrent is uh, a, a difficult one, a, a critical one, because our institutions need to be much more important to us as a society than the individuals and the personalities uh, that comprise them, particularly at the most senior levels. Uh, 
I would argue that even in the wake of the, the most uh, sort of traditionally uh, concerning disclosures to uh, institutions of government, uh, we have seen that there hasn't actually been and a, a proportional impact to society uh, that they've claimed. Rather, we've seen an impact to a small group of individual, a small group of officials, reputations and so on. Unfortunately, correcting that, I think, would require some sort of criminal sanction uh, for officials and whatnot who abuse access to secrecy, uh, who overclassify things, who overcontrol things, who structure funds and mechanisms in these ways that are not transparent, that are opaque, that are very difficult to uh, review and monitor. And we haven't seen that. Even in the last two years, when we have seen uh, sort of these uh, large-scale disclosures that have been reported on and have shown, for example, uh, official crimes uh, within the United States, for example, officials giving false testimony under oath, we haven't seen any sort of follow-up, any sort of penalty for officials who have broken those laws. They've only been for people on the small scale, uh, the actual individuals who were falling afoul of secrecy regulations. I'm not sure that's remediable uh, necessarily through the Council of Europe, but as you said, with Azerbaijan, with Russia, with other countries, it's very important that we set the norm uh, that we as civil society try to set standards of what the normative behavior is in terms of public access to information, uh, in terms of, as was mentioned, deterrent to uh, inappropriate official behavior. Uh, and we try to plant a flag as deeply as we can where things should be and then try to drag the rest of the world in that direction as best we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Halp, would you like to have a, a final word comment? You're on. We can't hear you. Can you turn on your, your, your microphone? He's still muted in the software. Yeah. It's muted in the software. I'm not sure. Dave, should you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, we do need to try to deter people from doing these things. And one is, is the threat of whistleblowing. But I think it's important to understand that most government officials do not think they're doing something wrong. Uh, and that so they do not fear the consequences because they think they're obeying the law and doing the right thing. Now, there are some cases of out and out corruption and so on. But for national security claims, I think we need to accept the fact that people think they're doing the right thing. So I think we need to have more accountability and we need to build into the system the notion that it's just as bad or maybe worse to overclassify as to underclassify. And that's not in most of the legislation, and most of, of the regulations. Uh, and people need to be held accountable when they do violate the law. And we're having that debate now in the United States on the torture issue and whether anybody who ordered the torture and permitted the torture will be held will be held accountable for it. But I think there also needs to be built into the legislation uh, something that makes it clear that it's just as bad and in some cases worse to overclassify as to underclassify. And we need to have, and the Chuane principles emphasize this, categories of information which it is simply illegal to classify, not based on your motive, but based on the content of the information. So if it's information about torture, about surveillance, which goes beyond the explicit law, it's simply the law has to say you may not classify it. And then I think people will fear that the whistleblowing may explode, expose the fact that they're violating those principles. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to let you know, the Schwani principles, there's a number of copies outside, but it was also a, a document that was, I think, five years, four to five years in the making. Um, and it was consulted by uh, people all over the world, judges, lawyers, civil society. And it was about to be published, and then it was published just in the month that Edward Snowden made his revelations, and it seemed incredibly timely. So some of these things are things that were being picked up by people who were working both with whistleblowers and in rights information and already starting to address them and putting in the idea that there needs to be whistleblowing protection and a public interest defense before we 
saw how important it was or how we believe it, how important it is. Do we have time for one or two questions? Uh, I, you've had a chance. Is there any other? No, I know. I'm just, just checking if there's another. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 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 Mr. Snowden, can, can you hear me? I hope so. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from the Russian service of the Voice of America. And I have, uh, I can't refrain from asking you two things. What are the conditions in which you can come back to the United States? And another one, are you happy with the quality of government under which you're in the jurisdiction you're living now? I think um, the, the second question isn't really one that, that I don't think you need to answer, but you can decide um, and also yeah, just feel I free. Think he, I, I think yeah. Mr. Snowden can decide, yeah. So, uh, in, in, I don't normally talk about my particular case here uh, because this is about a broader issue. This is about whistleblower protection. Um, when I talk about uh, the issues that I face, uh, I'll speak about them more in a representative sample, which is conditions of anyone in my position's return to the United States, anyone charged under the Espionage Act of 1917, as I have, for providing information to the American press, uh, is that they have to waive their right to a fair trial to return. They have to say that they will not uh, claim a public interest defense. Uh, they have to accept restrictions on the arguments that they can raise in court. Uh, they have to agree that they will not use certain terms, uh, raise uh, certain topics uh, that could be considered classified by the government, uh, because they would argue that you would be uh, committing a crime by discussing your defense in the courtroom because it would involve classified information itself. Uh, this is something that is very important uh, to resolve for all individuals, I think, uh, because if you can't mount a full and effective defense, uh, arguing that you revealed information to the public in the public interest, uh, you can't have a fair trial at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for coming and, uh, and for participating and for your patience with the technological hitches, which weren't really technological hitches, we're highly human. Um, and, uh, and I would like to thank uh, Mort Halpern for getting up very early and joining us, and for Martin Woods, who came yesterday and told the story and stayed on today to talk to you today, and to Peter Omsik, and to Mr. Edwards, I hope to meet you someday in person. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>